Hello, and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Stephen Greer, and this is Dr. Greer. I am uh, hosting this program today with Trudy Geiker, who's a senior member of the uh, Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, or CSETI.org uh, uh, contact team. And Trudy has been with us for many, many years and has traveled all over the world uh, on these research expeditions where we have made contact with extraterrestrial civilizations, and uh, she is a, just an amazing person for remote viewing and also uh, very advanced perceptual abilities and a very dear friend, and, and she's like a spiritual sister for me. And I'm very excited uh, that uh, Trudy can be with me today to discuss what has just happened. Uh, we've just returned in the last week or so from uh, our expedition on beautiful Marco Island, where we had a um, training team and an expedition for about a week uh, on this island in the Gulf of Mexico. And the events that happened there were some of the most absolutely amazing things that have ever happened. And we want to share that with the listeners for the World Puja Network because so much of what happened involved us doing a puja on the beach and then the things that followed that puja, which are really quite amazing. So uh, I'd like to welcome Trudy and thank you for being here with us today. Thank you, Steve. Well, to sort of set the stage, um, I want to just uh, explain, you know, we do these expeditions every, uh, well, maybe four or five times a year. Our next one is going to be in Colorado up in the mysterious valley, the San Luis Valley near Crestone, Colorado. And uh, we have a contact site also up on Blanca Peak, the sacred mountain of the east for the tribes of that part of the United States where we have had extraordinary contact uh, for many years. Actually, we've been going there since 1993. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, so this is our next expedition. It will be there in uh, Crestone, Colorado from June 24th to June 30th. And what these are for is, is that we, we're training people to become ambassadors to the universe. And what that means is that we feel that uh, since we have gotten the evidence uh, through the Disclosure Project and our own research that we're being visited by advanced interstellar civilizations, that the planet really needs to have people who are uh, enlightened and who are peaceful, who are wanting to make contact with these visitors so that they have a point of contact with humanity rather than just only through classified military projects. There are citizen ambassadors, and this is really what the purpose of these expeditions are. And we use three primary modalities uh, for contact, and you can read about these at cseti.org. And also now there's an iPhone app, those of you who have iPhones and iPads, um, that actually will take you through all the protocols, including the meditation and the remote viewing training and uh, what, uh, all the different protocols that we use. And we first began using this as an organization in 1990, so this is now our 21st year. And it's a really exciting approach because basically what we are doing is going out to areas with a group of people and we're using consciousness and higher states of consciousness to remote view extraterrestrial civilizations and then using a coherent thought process that emanates from deep awareness to connect to the extraterrestrial spacecraft and occupants and show them our location. So, for example, let's say that uh, while we're in Colorado, if we're in this very, very remote area of Colorado, we go into a group meditation, and people are trained to do this, and we use a mantra-type meditation, and then we go into unbounded uh, awareness. And then as we expand awareness we uh, can then begin to see our location and, and have images of uh, extraterrestrial spacecraft that they may be in the area or they may be out in deep space or even in another uh, star system. And if a person in the group, any individual, we then introduce ourselves to these civilizations and to these people as ambassadors from Earth, and then we turn it around from remote viewing them to allowing them to see through our vision, and we show them our location, and we show them then the Earth uh, as it would be located in our galaxy, and then we show them North America, and then zoom in to Colorado, and then straight into where we're going to be in Crestone, 
et cetera. So we do this wherever we are. And these protocols were first developed after a contact I had in 1973, uh, which is described in the book Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, um, sort of an autobiography that I wrote a few years ago, uh, which is now in, I think, eight or nine languages around the world. So that's one of the modalities we use, and it's very central to this, because what we had discovered, and what I discovered after I had a near-death experience in 1973, was that these civilizations, they utilize coherent, clear thought just like a laser is coherent light where all the wavelengths are linked up, just and they use it as scientifically as we use a laser or a cell phone, and that they actually have machinery. They have what we call transdimensional technologies um, that interface with consciousness and thought. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have consciousness-assisted technologies, which means they have technologies that their the ET's minds. Uh, can be uh, can can assist, but there's also technology that assists their consciousness in terms of projecting thought or projecting subtle energy or a presence. And this I describe as CAT and TAC, consciousness assisted technology and technology assisted consciousness, back in a, in a paper I wrote in 1990. And what we have found in researching this and even discussing DisclosureProject.org uh, witnesses who work for McDonnell Douglas who were actually sent by old man McDonald out to investigate cases where ET craft had landed and the ETs would have a little box with them, uh, usually even sometimes at their solar plexus level, that they use to send directed thought, almost like an electronic type of telepathy, to the person that they were meeting or having an encounter with and would also receive uh, thought that way. So we know that these interstellar civilizations are not using normal electromagnetic signals because let's look at it this way. If you're from the Andromeda galaxy, which is two and a half million light years from here, uh, it would take you two and a half million years to get a signal one way from there to Earth and another two and a half million years for that signal to get back if you were to return a signal. So we know that they're using this transdimensional type of uh, pulsed high resonant frequency electromagnetic signal and they interface with these other dimensions, one of which is this visual field of almost like astral energy of visual thought, especially when it is coming from this unified field of consciousness, which has been called samadhi, uh, this quiet, deep state of awareness. So this is really the core protocol that we teach. Uh, it, it's sort of where Vedic sciences and the science of consciousness um, and the science of the pujas meet uh, interstellar technologies. And so that's the central one. Now, the other ones that we use, we have some electronic tones that we have gotten from the ETs, both in crop circles, but also at CSETI events, where we have actually recorded electronic beeping tones that have come out of thin air, um, that actually when we heard one of these at Shasta, the people who heard it also saw the form of the spacecraft. Um, and it was very, very clear. It's like the sound created the form, which those of you who've studied the Vedas and, and know the Puja, is all about name and form, where the sound vibration creates the actual form in the astral subtle energy, which can then materialize into linear space-time. Well, this tone and the other tones that we have are then sent from our contact site, um, and are then also sent out over radio waves as well as just into the air as sort of a signature of the C-SETI contact team being present. Um, so that's the second one that we use. And then the third is that we use some high-powered lasers. The one I have uh, is one that goes about 200 miles uh, into space um, uh, in clear conditions when it's uh, you know not cloudy. And... That is used as a precise vector point so that if there's any ambiguity in terms of how we are remote viewing and sending our location, because some people are clearer at remote viewing and sending precision than others, they get a precise lock-on from the laser and also the electronic tones. So we're using light, we're using these tones, sound, and we're using consciousness and expanded awareness with coherent thought. So those are the protocols we're using, and it has resulted in really astonishing levels of contact uh, that has frankly escalated in the last two or three years in an exponential way. And this is why 
the, the book that we just have just recently released is called Contact Countdown to Transformation, which you can get at DisclosureProject.org, and it actually has with it a DVD that shows some of the encounters we've had with the ET spacecraft. It has the tones on it. Um, it has a lot of the images um, as of the uh, fall of 09. Interestingly, though, in the last year and a half, the amount of contact we've had has gone up exponentially. We're going to have to come out with a, a new book and a new DVD very soon, I think, Trudy, but okay. particularly after what just happened in Marco Island. So I just wanted to give people this sort of background on what the CSETI we call it the CE5 initiative, and what a CE5 is, is a close encounter of the fifth kind. And uh, basically, a close encounter of the fifth kind is when humans either cooperate with the ET craft and, and occupants or initiate it in a diplomatic way. And uh, Dr. Richard Haynes at NASA wrote a book about CE5s of people who had spontaneously engaged in CE5s historically throughout the world, and I had encouraged him to write that. And the book is called CE5. Um, but this was a term that I coined in 1990 to describe this unique category of contact where humans, instead of just staring passively at a craft or being passive when an ET spacecraft or being is nearby, are actually stepping into an empowered, proactive state where we're actually making the contact and inviting the contact as ambassadors from Earth and as humans to these other civilizations. And one of the things that's so important in understanding this process is that the more that people do it, the more it creates the morphogenic field that Rupert Sheldrake talks about in consciousness where, where it empowers this as a way for the future. It opens up a vector into the future that manifests the good future that's peaceful with these civilizations rather than historically over the last 60 years what's happened has been a militaristic response that's been very classified where today we have weapons that are staged uh, in space that target and shoot at these uh, extraterrestrial vehicles as they approach the earth using so-called scalar or longitudinal electromagnetic weapons that go faster than the speed of light. These are weapons that humans have developed, uh, unfortunately, since the 40s and 50s and have now, since the mid-60s, been placed in space in violation of all the space uh, treaties. But the group that is doing this really doesn't care about the Constitution, the rule of law, as, as those of you who listen to the orionproject.org and and also DisclosureProject.org witnesses. But I think that what we're saying is that it's time for humans to step forward, uh, and not just one or two of us, but thousands of us who understand the power of consciousness and of thought and of action together to change the future in the direction of peaceful uh, contact. And that's precisely what CSETI and the CE5 initiative is doing. So uh, we, we've been doing this now uh, for 20, over 20 years, and uh, we find that as time goes forward, I think we're in this sort of final countdown to when there's going to be a worldwide event where the whole world is going to know that we're not alone. And right now, the CSETI team is the vanguard team, uh, the pioneering team that is doing this on an organized basis around the world. And in fact, We've been modeling this for um, heads of state and, and other leaders around the world. There's a G7 country, G7 being the top seven industrialized countries. Um, and one of these G7 countries has written to me um, uh, commenting that they are very interested in what we're doing and actually in the last uh, year have had a representatives at an event, uh, a CE5 event that we held, uh, to learn more about how this contact is made because they really think it's time to end the secrecy and have the, the leaders of the world make peaceful, open contact. So the work we're doing is being watched in a number of sectors, but the key and the heart of it is really the average person. doesn't matter if you're a, a doctor or a lawyer or a housewife in Chandler or whatever you are, because if you're conscious and awake and, and you can go into this quiet state of awareness, you can see into distant places but also into the future, and you can make contact with these civilizations. And this is what everyone needs to understand is that 
it isn't about whether or not the president of the United States does this. It's whether or not we the people do it. And then eventually, as more of us do it, it will create the morphogenic field that will then manifest the good future of universal peace and contact. So that's really what we are doing and what it's all about. So, um, Trudy, why don't you share with the listeners um, some of what has happened in the past uh, week or two while we were at Marco Island, because it was just such an action-packed week of amazing events that were, I think, some of the most important that we've ever had. Okay. Uh, What I'd like to do is I'd like to share uh, things that happened that uh, uh, were at least two of us, uh, uh, it happened to, you know, we shared this uh, uh, event. And uh, that's what I'd like to do. I saw so many things by myself that, you know, I could go on and on. But I'd like to share what I saw with other people. Uh, Okay, the very first night, um, I saw uh, stretching from the Pleiades into Orion constellation. It was a ghostly white shape in the shape of a French, uh, a loaf of bread, French bread. It was elongated like right. that. And I saw it and then I didn't. It was very quick. And uh so I reported what I saw. Then a a person who was new to the training said that he had seen it also. And so I was overjoyed that he saw it too. Then later on he told me that he had he had seen it for maybe three or four seconds. But he was new, and he was shy to say anything. Right. And so I think what happened is that the ETs allowed me to see them so I would report it. Right. I thought that was a that, – and that was the first night. Well, yeah, the first night we were out, and it was quite close because I, we, I had seen a similar one, and as – we were setting up on this beach, or we have these electronic detectors began to go off in a very specific pattern. And the electronic detectors we have actually register when the transdimensional electronics of the ETs is present or on site. And we had that happening while uh, Trudy and this other, this new person, a trainee, had this experience. And I had seen a very similar craft in a a different direction before you arrived that that blipped in very quickly. And what happens is that these ET spacecraft, what they do, they can be in your environment but dematerialize. They're sort of resonating faster than the speed of light. I have to explain this. And when they come through the crossing point of light and step down into the frequency of linear space-time, suddenly they'll just be there. It isn't like they fly in like in a Hollywood movie. They're just there, and then they're not there. And it can happen in a split second. It can be there for several minutes, or it can be there, as you're going to hear, for three hours, like we had an experience on one night. But I think that this is why it's so interesting to have a number of people who are connecting and uh, and, and and looking at what is happening. But didn't you feel that that one was actually quite close? I mean, oh, very close, very very close. You know, probably what quarter of a mile away, maybe. Right. You know, yeah, it, it was within close. a couple, yeah, a thousand or two thousand feet yeah, away. It was huge. You know, stretching from the Pleiades to the Orion constellation. My goodness, that's huge. <laughs> yes. And those of you who don't, you look at the night sky, that's a pretty big area of, of sky. Um, if you look at an airplane in the sky that's up at about 30,000 feet, they look like a tiny little mosquito. Uh, this was something big and very, very close. And we had a number of these craft that came in and, as you're going to hear, uh, ended up having a, a massive a flotilla of craft that also came in. Um, I would like to share another thing that happened. Uh, uh, this happened on uh, Monday night, and um, uh, we heard a series of – there were four tones that were heard. Right. And uh, uh, it was uh, very anomalous because the, it, nobody had any kind of electrical uh, cell phones or anything like that go off. Everything was turned off. But I heard four different tones. And what was unique uh, about it for me was that whenever I heard the tone, I saw an area of about uh, four feet in diameter. It was like a disc 
of blue, various shades of blue, and uh, with what seemed like pixels scattered throughout this area. And uh, and so when I reported it, uh, you, Steve, said that you had seen uh, seen that also the definite shape and uh, uh, and size what I of what I saw. Right, and that was also very nearby. And what what began to happen as we go through an evening, and we're using the tones, and we do a meditation, and do the the vectoring as we call it, where we vector the craft in. We'll begin to have things happen actually in the field, like on the beach where we were, where there would be a brilliant uh, blue uh, sphere or a red sphere. But in this case. Uh, there was a uh, an electronic tone that came out of thin air, but it was very near where I was sitting, um, it was to my right. And uh, I think every almost everyone in the circle, uh, about 18 people, heard this, and uh, it happened more than once. And Fine. yes, these beautiful tones. And each time it happened. Uh, there were were the sightings of these uh, almost celestial like I mean the colors well you just have to describe them they're almost like jewel like celestial intense colors of of objects that would appear uh, near us yes in the circle on people behind people on top of people it's wonderful <laughs> yeah it is amazing and and of course there too it gets into this whole concept of name and form where there's tonality associated with the manifestation of interstellar uh, technologies. And I call this transdimensional interstellar, TDIS, is a, a term that I'm, I'm introducing because it is, most people think of, well, they see a UFO and they're thinking, well, it's, it's kind of like a, a, a 747. And, and they can be fully materialized like that, but if they are, You'll notice they have no seams. The light coming from them is like not of this world because everything is so pure, because the way they materialize and the way they even ma manifest these spacecraft is through a type of manufacturing where the tonality, uh, a tone is set up deep emanating from the conscious astral realm, and it comes from there into three-dimensional manifestation. So even the physical materials and lights and metals are incredibly pure, more pure than you can make even in the vacuum of space. And I know scientists who've studied uh, some of the uh, remains of craft that we've, after we've, if they have been materialized and we've shot them down and destroyed them, that the, the materials are unbelievably pure alloys and pure stuff. And, and that's why the light that you see when you're on these expeditions, when you see these objects, it doesn't look like, like a light from a flashlight or a light from a headlight or, or, or a house window. It's, it has this extraordinary radiance and purity and crystalline quality to it, I think. Don't you think, Trudy? Absolutely. That? Oh, yes. They're, they're alive. <laughs> They're absolutely alive. Right. So. Which is another thing to remember. Um, one of the things I introduce is the co idea of uh, conscious nanobio machines, and that is that the ET craft are an extension of the ET consciousness and their life, and they're actually living crystalline uh, objects that are conscious but also are biological, that you get a sense that they're living and intelligent and conscious, even if it's the craft itself. And it's almost like the level of artificial intelligence is so advanced from these civilizations that even the spacecraft have a living conscious quality to them, which they do. And so it's simply not the same as a Lockheed Martin anti-gravity. I mean, we, we do have classified projects that have uh, studied this area of science and have made anti-gravity crap, but those things uh, have an incredibly different feeling uh, because they're just machines. And the, the actual extraterrestrial vehicles, people say, how do you tell the difference between an, uh, an alien reproduction vehicle or ARV versus an ET spacecraft? I said, oh, it's like night and day. Once you experience both, as we have on these expeditions, there's really no comparison at all. Um, I would like to uh, uh, tell 
our audience about something that I saw. Uh, uh, I saw it, and but it's important. Um, I saw up in the sky about 50 degrees. It was like um, if you can picture a half of a of a of a wine cork, and uh, it was that size and shape. A, a, a light in the sky, and uh, the top half was uh, black, gray, and white with, it was downward streaks on it. The bottom half was cream colored. Now, I saw this for maybe two seconds or more, and that's a long time to see these objects. And But instead of it fading away or blinking out, it imploded on itself. Right. And I had never seen that before. I'd heard about it, but I had never seen it. And it was it was so close to materialization. Uh, you know, at one iota more, and it would have it have been material. Right. But it imploded on itself. Right. And it, what that is is that it's actually folding back into transdimensional space time. So if you visualize linear space time and the speed of matter and electrons and the speed of light. Uh, there's other dimensions that are faster uh, or at or different frequencies and resonant frequencies, and that's what your astral body is. But you can be between the two. So in other words, this is sort of like when something is emerging from this interdimensional realm and beginning to appear in three-dimensional space-time, and then when it vanishes, it literally folds back into and folds in on itself. And I have seen this a number of times, and it's really... You, when you see it, you never forget it. Oh, it was the most amazing thing. It was, you know, it's just one of those things that kind of changes you at your core because it's so incredible. So, um, another thing I would like to to mention um, it was with you and me, Steve, um, as we were joining hands at a med- during a meditation, uh, Steve said. He had he saw a large light on the horizon, and horizon, and when he said that, at, I know at the exact same time he saw his light on the horizon, I saw this large flare of light shine across the the uh, uh, sand in in the midst of our circle. Right, right in the circle. Right in the circle. At the exact same time, he saw the light on the horizon. Right. And we had a number of objects that came in that were brilliant. Uh, during one of the breaks, we had two brilliant, almost like starbursts, a blindingly bright light, like someone had a flashbulb camera and took it off. But I mean, it was, but more pure than that, that appeared um, right, uh, well, within uh, 50 feet or so of where the circle uh, and where our spot was on this beach. We were at a state uh, Park Beach that was just fantastic sight. It was amazing. I, mean, I think I almost certainly we're going to go back there next year. Um, and we had it just for our group, and there was nobody else there. And it was uh, this object that came in, and it was a celestial God consciousness ET arrival, just like we've seen at Mount Shasta and also where we've been in Joshua Tree, where we've been in meditation in my brilliant burst of light will occur just above the group inside the circle um, that's so bright that people can see the veins of their eyelids. And it's this download of energy uh, that's interstellar um, civilizations. But these are incredibly advanced civilizations where uh, if you can visualize it, it'd be like the story of the Shambhala kingdom on earth where, you know, everyone was in a state of enlightenment and God consciousness where there's an entire world that have evolved that are millions of years more developed than we are here on earth, that all of their technology, (laughs) excuse me, all of their technology and all of their sciences are emanating from that level of consciousness, from the celestial level, but they're physical. And when they arrive, there can be this arrival of energy and just pure light. And it is, the word pure light, I mean, it gets overused, but it is like that. It, there's a purity to it and a power and an energy w- associated with it. What's wonderful is that we have a member of our team who's been getting some amazing photographs of these, which are actually, some of them are in this DVD that are with the new book, uh, Contact Countdown to Transformation, 
uh, that you can get at DisclosureProject.org. But there are many others that we'll be coming out with soon because in the last year or a little over a year, we've had so many, literally when I say hundreds of these objects that we've been able to film, both on videotape but also uh, with the really excellent digital still photography. And that's what you're talking about, Trudy. Is that both, we saw this at the same time, and we'll have to see if it's on the video. There's, it's a lot of reviewing a videotape to see, but I have a feeling that that might have come in on the video. Um, uh, next, I guess we should get into Wednesday night, that spectacular night. It's, oh. Uh, <laughs> um, it uh, started, I think, when um, um, Stephen did a puja in the center of the circle, and that was for the first time. Right. Usually I do them outside the circle, and the ETs come around the puja table. Um, as you all heard when we were in France um, last summer, um, and also in England, um, where we're going to be going back there into the crop circles in England this summer. For those of you who want to join us, we're going to be in England um, July 24th to the 31st. And where we actually do the, our contact work in the crop circles. But the pujas I've been doing are usually outside the circle, uh, some, you know, maybe 10 yards away. This particular night, I was instructed um, and intuitively gained the information that I should do a really special puja inside the circle. So there is a circle of about uh, 17 people. And I did the puja right in the center of the circle. And this particular night, the meditation that I led, I created a double tetrahedron, uh, like a Merkaba, that as we after we went into deep meditation and after the puja, we then expanded in this Merkaba out through the earth and out through our solar system and the Milky Way and then out through intergalactic space and then the entire cosmos. And then as we came back in this Merkaba, we were asking all these higher intelligent civilizations and interstellar civilizations to come back with us. And we came back in this uh, astral Merkaba this double, if you look at a tetrahedron and put them together, and it was spinning, where the top was spinning counterclockwise and the bottom was spinning clockwise. And the the Merkaba was actually created by the mantra we use, which is a three-syllable mantra that has tonality. Da, 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 da. And actually, all of this is on the website if you want to get this meditation with this mantra. So as we created this Merkaba with the mantra, people connected and we traveled in this Merkaba throughout the cosmos and then came back. And after we came back, the most astonishing series of things began to happen that lasted literally for three hours. Yes. that uh, I've got to say that uh, you doing the, uh, the Merkaba uh, during that meditation was probably – the most powerful one that you've done yet. It was uh, it was it was unbelievably powerful, and I think everybody felt it. So um, that was the setting for what happened later. <laughs> okay, and um, I think what happened then was uh, we began seeing, or Stephen and uh, another fellow began seeing light. Over the um, over the Gulf and over some uh, mangroves that were in the distance, and they were seeing a lot of lights through their night scopes. Now, most of us, we none of us had, uh, except for the two of them, uh, had night scopes, so we did not see the hundreds of lights that they saw. But I saw quite a few out in the sky and out over the, the mangroves, mangroves. I saw hundreds of lights myself, but they were at ground level and over the water in the lagoon. Right. And, uh, and the lights that I, that I saw that were near the, the mangroves, further away from us, I felt were craft. And the lights that were came closer to us, uh, to our circle, and came into the circle were beings. 
Yes, they were ET beings that were in this sort of electronic astral projection phase, just like the, the, the picture we have from Joshua Tree from 2009 of this ET that visited us from the Andromeda galaxy that, that is actually up on our website. So, uh, I, you know, I cannot, I cannot, uh, you know, I, I, I did not see as many lights as you did, Steve. You know, I wish I could have, but I just couldn't because with my naked eye, I saw a fraction of the ones that you saw. But, you know, these other lights and things were just <laughs> hundreds for me to see. And, um, uh, okay, so that started. And, and uh, during a time... Uh, when we were quiet and we were seeing, I saw off in the distance uh, at the at the edge of the lagoon <clears throat> a group. I saw an energy, a group of energy forms, and they moved toward us, toward our toward our circle. And then they came. They came and and came within. I would say, what what's on the other side of that little reed island? What, what what was that about thirty feet twenty feet? Yeah, yes, about that. Yeah. Yeah, and they and they came behind this little reed island that was near our circle, and and then I didn't see them anymore. And then uh, later on, when uh, after a break, I think it was after the break. Uh, we were seeing so many things out there on the sand, and Steve got up, and he went out toward the lagoon. He left the circle, and he walked out into the, out into the sand. And when he did that, I saw this group of entities that I had seen, you know, go behind the island. They came out from behind the island there. They came across the little reed island, and they got behind Steve. And they made a semicircle, and they followed Steve out onto the sand. Right. And that's, you know, that's what I saw. That was pretty amazing. And uh, and they were with him as he went out and in, out into the uh, uh, to the sand area there to do his work. And while all this was happening, what I want to describe that was being seen by everyone on the team saw some of these. Some saw more than others, depending on how tall they were and also whether they had binoculars. But in the looking towards the Gulf, now there's no buildings there, there are no lights. It was just the State Beach. If I can, and we're on a radio show, so I have to kind of describe the setting out where we were facing. There was the beach, and then there was a little lagoon and some mangroves, and then beyond that, the Gulf of Mexico. And the mangroves were maybe a football field away. This is a distance, maybe 100 to 150 yards, um, because during the daytime, you could actually walk across this little lagoon to them. Uh, what was fascinating is that after we did this uh, double tetrahedron meditation with uh, what they call a Merkaba, and the Merkaba was made by the mantra that was given to us at Crestone, where we're going to be in June, by the way. Um, it's a very powerful uh, meditation. We began, I felt, that there was not just some ETs came, but that, and this is another member of the team who saw this, that every civilization that could reach Earth joined in that meditation because we did a meditation for the healing of the earth and for universal peace and that they were there in a sort of etheric and astral energy form but had come in a massive vortex um, and in fact the area where we saw these brilliant white lights that would just appear in the sky or in, even in front of these mangrove uh, bushes that were maybe uh, 100 yards away or 150 yards away, they would appear and then swirl and then go back up into this vortex area. And it was an area that covered at least one to two miles. It was not just one little area. It went from uh, from left to right. If you're facing out towards the Gulf where we were, it literally covered a one or two miles of beach area. 
And there were people. We have a man that was there from Puerto Rico who did not have night vision, and he saw hundreds of these because he was on our side of the circle, a little bit up on an embankment where he could get a little higher view. And these were clearly nothing man-made, and they were certainly very, very, very close. We do have these on videotape. Um, the, we have an excellent video camera, and the man who was operating that, I, I haven't gotten up with him yet to see uh, how much of this actually got on videotape. But if you can visualize a massive vortex one or two miles across that had within and it folded within space-time transdimensionally, literally thousands, and I'm not exaggerating, thousands of representatives from civilizations. And what they did is that they kept materializing as these beautiful lights that were seen with the naked eye and also with our night scopes. They kept emerging and appearing and then vanishing into this one area uh, out over the mangroves and over the Gulf of Mexico. It was unbelievably astonishing and this is not something that lasted for a few seconds this was three hours of this um, and so over the course of that time I saw somewhere on the order of several hundred of them um, and some people saw fewer who didn't have any binoculars or night scopes and, and some people saw something in between but depending on where you were looking because it was such a large area to see over and um, we also had still photography that caught some very interesting objects as well during this time. And then what was happening is that there was there were these, I call it electronic astral projection. You know, those of you who've had a flying lucid dream, you know, where you're you're kind of flying over a place, that's your astral body, your body of light. But the extraterrestrial civilizations, when they're going faster than the speed of light, their spacecraft, their bodies, everything is in an energy form that approximates. It's very close to, to the astral, and that's why it's interdimensional travel. But they can actually then be in that form, and instead of fully materializing in the flesh, they can appear on the beach with us as these scintillating lit forms, but it isn't just like a sparkle of light or an orb. You actually see a vertical uh, area where a being is. And I saw many, many, many of them that were on the beach, and so did other people on the team. And I think that's what you're describing, Trudy. You actually saw yeah. these beings yeah. uh, that were uh, extraterrestrial, and they were there. Uh, of course, a lot of people say, why don't they just fully materialize? And I said, well, when you hear what happened the next night, you'll understand why. Um, but uh, we'll get to that in a moment. But this particular night was really, you know, we've been telling people for a long time that we're coming to sort of a crescendo of contact where this subject is going to be unveiled massively. And there have got to be people who are prepared to make contact peacefully, who can educate the people that they know why these ETs are here what we should do to interact with them, and how to interact with them appropriately. And that's what these training expeditions are for. And for those of you who can't come to them, there is now a training program on the DisclosureProject.org. Uh, DisclosureProject.org is the website uh, where you can go and get this program that has all this information and meditations and, and the tones that you need to broadcast and how you do this. But um, being there's nothing like being there if, if you can be there. And uh, that's when these beings were there and when I went out to greet them, I literally at times felt like I was going to vanish. And some people looking at me saw me as if they could see through me. There is actually a photograph where I actually do become transparent in it. Um, <clears throat> one thing I would like to, to say, uh, uh, when Steve walked out onto the sand and was uh, 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 reading the, the our friends, um, I was standing there and suddenly, in total physical form, I saw two ETs walk in full stride, walking toward me in full stride. I saw them for a couple of seconds. Right. Physically there. They were fully materialized, yes. Fully materialized, but <clears throat> only for a couple of seconds. And I And it was in the same uh, area where I where, Yeah, and it was in the same area where I had heard them walking near the, the grass island, the reed island. But I recognized the two people, two tall men, humanoid, male, <clears throat> about between six and seven feet tall, 
and as the two um, <clears throat> two of the four people that we had seen in uh, uh, physical form in 2006 at Joshua Tree. Right. In the and it was those two people that I saw that night. So that was amazing. It, yeah, it is amazing. And this is what was going on. All this was going on for three hours. <laughs> various components of this and. Excuse me. The other thing that happened is that there was an ET that came in and began to interact with this magnetometer that was between me and a member of our team uh, named Emery. And he and I have this connection with this one ET uh, that started actually in France where they actually come into the circuitry of the magnetometer and will start beating and pulsing almost like a heartbeat. And this a magnetometer is something that picks up the magnetic field fluxing. And if you're out in a wilderness area, there should be no magnetic field fluxing unless you put a machine near this, this uh, detector. Uh, and we didn't have any motors or machines out there. And we had this happen. And whenever it happens, then we'll be we'll get quite excited about it, and the magnetometer will literally go off the scale. And this is also what happened. And you can actually feel the energy of these extraterrestrial transdimensional beings that are there that intimately and that close to us. So there were so many experiences that all, all the different members of the team were having that I hate to say this, but literally an entire book could be written about that night. It was just beyond belief. There were so many things happening. I couldn't keep up. It was like my my eyes and my ears and my whole body was just like jerking around because there were so many things going on. I, I couldn't keep up with it. It was it was so active. And uh but the thing that initiated it was, you know, we did the puja in the center of the circle, which we had never mm -hmm. done. Right. And, uh, you know, we can talk about these things on the World Puja Network because everyone who listens to this are cool and understand what a puja is and the Vedas are in consciousness. And that the energy that was created, um, and I have to say there's a member of our team who that night had just was recovering from major surgery uh, and was in the ICU, not someone who came on this, but a very, very dear man who's a, a dear friend. He's just a, a beautiful spirit. And I also knew that he was, even though he was still in a, a medically induced coma, that his spirit was there assisting with this amazing contact event. And I had dedicated this particular puja to his healing. I don't know if you remember that truth. I absolutely do. And so... There was an element there of of such beauty, um, and that's you know that's what we do. I mean, we're ambassadors. It's not just you know sort of a people think of that as like a political thing. It's a deeply spiritual state of being recognizing that we're all one in spirit. That the conscious mind, the consciousness itself, the essence of awareness is a single spark of awareness that is alive within all things and all people. And that's how we approach these ETs. We don't see them as otherness, and we never use the word alien for that reason, because alien means otherness. We view this as oneness. And so the whole philosophy of CSETI is to be bringing that together in a state of oneness. And that is really why the contact is happening, but it, the way it's manifesting. I mean, to be out on a state beach um, and to have literally hundreds of these objects emerging into our space-time and then vanishing and moving and swirling, seen by all these people, is almost beyond the mind to, to reckon. And, it, you know, thank God we had videotape ro rolling because this w is on the videotape. And But what was beyond what the videotape will ever capture, which I was seeing in the remote viewing, is that this was the essences in, in sort of electronic form of this massive vortex of what I've called for years the gathering. And, Trudy, you may want to talk about your experience with the gathering, but we know that it's at one time it was potential and then it was on the move, and now with this event, what they're saying is that we're here. Yes, yes, it is. Um, you want me to, to tell about that? My oh, yeah. Experience at the Zen Center? Is that what you want? Yes, because that was the same day that the mantra, the tonality of the mantra was given to me that's in the training materials. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> 
I'm, actually, I can't remember the year now. I'm, it was 07. 07, okay. Uh, we were at uh, in uh, Crestone, and we were at a Zen um, uh, Dome Center, uh, the beautiful dome-shaped center that is uh, uh, big and round and and. But anyway, Stephen was doing a um, meditation uh, in the Zen Dome, which is a very spiritual place. And uh, I had this vision just suddenly. It was there. And I was looking down on a vast, um, looking down on a huge area of clouds. And they were like popcorn clouds. And, um, and, And I thought, what in the world is this? Then it seemed like the the each little popcorn cloud became um, a, 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 a being or became alive, and I thought, what is this? All these people in all this energy and all these people gathered. It was like an army, and I thought, oh, well, you know, I don't like armies. I mean, you know, the idea of war and all that, and it's that I thought. Well, it is. It's a gathering of, uh, these are all celestial beings and and cosmic beings of all kinds. And they were there gathered. And I realized what it was is that the cosmic forces are all gathering, were gathering to, to combat all the, all this negativity and uh, ugliness that is going on with with the contacting ETs and the in the in the bad picture that's being put out there uh, about ETs and and it's going to come to an end and, and that was to me it was the gathering of all these forces angelic celestial cosmic all kinds of beings ETs everybody. In the in the cosmic in the cosmos is gathering, amassing to actually go to war spiritually, spiritual warriors gathering, and uh, at that time it was a gathering. Then last year in Shasta, I had an experience where everything that transpired during that training was an indication to me that it was no longer, this army was no longer amassing. They had amassed, and they were had started the move. Right. They had started, the war had started. And I, I, I don't, you know, I don't know how to explain it other than that, and it sounds ugly, war. But well, I call it the transformation. It's the transformation of right. this sort of time of, of chaos and destruction and militarism right. into a time of universal peace. And we're all there, spirit but there, warriors. But it, well, that's the whole thing. The Shambhala warrior, the spirit uh-huh. warrior, doesn't mean physical violence. It right. means the power of enlightenment and oneness trumping that of division and violence. Oh, let, so, me, finish, let me finish my little story. And so when this was done, you know, all of a sudden I'm looking down on this cloud, on these clouds, and then up from underneath, came this pushed up from underneath the clouds was a face right and uh so that was my vision well that face you felt was like the face of god absolutely right right it was yeah. and it was an hour after that that i was in med- private meditation after i led this god consciousness um cosmology meditation in the zen dome that I went and then meditated by myself, and I went into the samadhi state. And as I was emerging out of the utter peace and nothingness of pure mind, I heard da 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 da. These three pure notes emerging out of consciousness. I'm not very musical, as you can tell, but they became this mantra. And this is the mantra we now teach people. And it is very powerful. And when you use it, it can make, if you do it three times, it makes it a tetrahedron, you know, a three-sided uh, triangle, like a pyramid, but it's three sides instead of four. And then if you do it another three times, it makes a double one. And that's what we traveled out in the space with, that we then gathered all of these cosmic forces 
um, there at Marco Island. And we're going to do this every time now, actually. Yes. It's going to oh, become good. a new protocol. Oh, and, as, you uh, said, as you said that, Steve, I just got such – my whole body was just covered with goosebumps. Yeah, no, this is this is a I, – I, I've done this privately for a long time, and now I'm going to start doing it publicly where I'm combining the mantra tonality and that form in the meditation and in, in the gathering. And so, you know, there, there, anyway, I, I, I've, I've had this sort of experience since I was 18, but there's a time for everything, and I was told – that's why I was told when this event happened to do the puja in the center of the circle – and to do this meditation with the Merkaba and the mantra together, which creates this powerful energy and force field that is unbelievable in terms of what t- transpires. And it's because we're at this point where, and, and un, uh, interestingly, it was the next night or so in the wee hours that the massive tsunami and earthquake happened in Japan. Yes. Yes. Of which there are a number of videotapes of people having seen these kind of trans-dimensional lights and objects that were around that area when it happened. Um, and there's a connection there, and that is, uh, and I don't want to sound apocalyptic at all, but the world is in really serious trouble. I mean, we're 100 years off of our designated optimal path, let me just call it that. Our designated optimal path would have been to have had, about 100 years ago, uh, energy from the vacuum, uh, uh, so-called free energy, uh, world peace, the end of war, uh, the abundance of a peaceful civilization that would have been using these very advanced technologies that Tesla and Faraday in the late 1800s were discovering and which were brutally suppressed by the J.P. Morgans and the Rockefellers of their era, just as the J.P. Morgans and and, and similar ones of our era continue to brutally suppress. But the problem is, is that the Earth, Gaia, which is a conscious being, and we always do this meditation with the Earth consciousness, with Gaia, because she is a conscious being, not a human, and not an ET, but is an actually a planetary conscious being, which is 100% true. And I describe this in great detail in my book, Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, when I had this experience when I went out into space and actually met Gaia as a being. And she's really straining under the weight of the silliness on the foolishness of how humans are living because here we have these nuclear power plants and fossil fuels and all these raging wars and all the kind of pollution and damage going on and none of it's necessary and she knows that and we know it and so at a certain point there's going to have to be a transformative event that stops the madness so we don't destroy the earth because the earth is supposed to uh, continue as a womb for the evolution of intelligent life and enlightenment in this age of enlightenment that's going it's a whole new yuga as we say in, in the vedas um or sanskrit but it's a a time period of, of half a million years that we're just now opening into and so the, the this old world of of conflict and competition and destruction and even the way we live technologically is a reflection of that destructive consciousness because we're using fission of uranium and burning of coal and burning of oil when what we need to be using are technologies that are these elegant electromagnetic technologies that we talk about at the orionproject.org that you pull energy from the fabric of space-time and it harms nothing there's no pollution you don't burn anything and has the added bonus that it liberates the population of the world from the macroeconomic slavery, which has led to so much disparity of wealth and poverty. And so all of these are changes which are 100 years overdue, and you can only stretch out this timeline so far before it snaps back. And the message that we are getting from these contact experiences is that if there was this gathering of forces and then it was on the move this event on Marco Island was the signal that they're here and that the pace of contact is going to increase even as the pace of global change and global transformation increases. And that's that's what I have been told and seen. The, uh, uh, let's see, the, we're almost out of time, I think. Um, the, uh, 
one of the last things I would like to comment is that on the we the very last night we were uh, there were six or seven of us left at the at the site, oh, we and did. we were packing up. And as we were packing up, we heard a series of beautiful tones. Oh, it was beautiful. And out of nowhere, out of nowhere, they just came out of the air. They were like musical celestial tones that materialized around us as we were departing on our last night. It was stunning. It was. It was almost as if as if it was a musical goodbye. And, and thank you and from the ETs. Right. It's beautiful. Right, until we meet again. That's so, right. Yeah, exactly. And as we were leaving, we have this detector called a storm tracker that picks up electrostatic uh, when a uh, lightning bolt strikes. And it was the, the weather there that whole week was just beautiful. And there was no electricity anywhere from, from man-made sources. And this particular thing, as soon as we started to move, started going off. And the ETs were connected to us every time I would go to and from this site in the vehicle with uh, with the, the person driving me, Emery, this detector would go off as if it was locked on to our lead car, almost like a cosmic GPS, and it would do it wherever we move. And it also did the same thing in, in England when we were there last year. So they're so connected to what we're doing. And anyway, I, and I hope people will be able to join us in Colorado. As I mentioned, we're going to be there June 24th to the 30th. And um, we're keeping these training expeditions fairly small to around uh, 15 uh, new people and then our, our senior team. Um, and then we'll be in England, in, in Wiltshire, England, near Stonehenge. We're staying at a place very near Stonehenge. And we'll be there at the heart of where all the crop circle activity has been all these years and where we had the big 100-foot diameter disc land in 1992. Um, and that will be July 24th to 31st, and, and then we'll be at Mount Shasta again in August, from August 21st to 27th, and, and, and then at Joshua Tree, where we've had so many amazing things occur in California, in the high desert of California, October 23rd to 29th. So those of you who can join us, uh, you can go to CSETI.org, CSETI.org, and find out more about these expeditions. And um, if you can't get time off to come, we do have the, the training program at the disclosureproject.org. And I think it's very important that people learn to do these protocols because we've had people who who have just gotten the training materials and gone to their local areas with some friends and done this, and they've started having amazing contact because the protocols work. And the more that people do this, the more it creates this morphogenic field of transform, transformation and consciousness, and this is really what has to happen. So... Um, this time. The time has come for that to happen. Well, I'd like to uh, thank you, Trudy, for sharing your experiences. Uh, I know there are many more things that happened that week, but we're out of time now. It would take it would take a month program. I know. It would take a month program. It really would because there's so many things just to even articulate them. It, it was a nonstop every night, these sorts of events. But you get an idea of kind of what happens on these expeditions from this. So um, I hope uh, to see some of you who are listening to the World Pusha Network. I'd like to thank the folks at the World Pusha Network for uh, hosting us every two weeks here. And uh, this has uh, been Dr. Stephen Greer with Conversations with Dr. Greer. And until next time, keep looking up and God bless you.